Yes, we return to the rolling hills of Fable 3, the most loved Fable game. That's an irritating statement, I'm 100% aware, but at least I have your attention now. In my last video I talked a little bit about my love for the game and also its shortcomings whilst hammering the economy into the ground, but the one thing that video doesn't cover is this game's expansions, if you can even call them that for the most part. This game's downloadable content. Why? Because though I'd played through Fable 3 an unhealthy amount of times, after all it's my favourite economy crashing simulator, I had never once installed a single piece of downloadable content to enhance the experience. So as it turns out, Fable 3 has a fair bit of DLC going for it, most of which was either released simultaneously with the game, or in the months following. So bearing in mind I have Game Pass, I installed all the expansions that were listed as free, and also purchased a couple that sounded interesting. But I didn't purchase every single DLC this game has because frankly, I'm not paying any amount of money for a die pack. It's a matter of principle. So naturally I installed the ones that actually seemed like they added something of value. So as you can imagine, the five star dog potion didn't make the cut. What the fuck even is that? Also, the Fable 3 free game content is no longer available so I'll never know what that is either. But I got some cool stuff, dog breeds, some weapons and armour that I'm almost certain to never use, and a couple of other things that I'm also sure I'll never understand why they weren't included in the base game. But there are a couple of questline DLCs that I thought would be worth a video. Somebody suggested I give this a gander in the comments to one of my Fable videos, so I renamed my dog and embarked on a new adventure. Why do the mannequins exist in a perpetual state of existential crisis? So now that hopefully you understand the premise of the video, please enjoy the Fable expansions I never played. So first and foremost, I decided to check out the Understone quest pack. Considering that of the two main DLCs, this was the one of least substance, I'm honestly surprised it was the one that cost me actual money. Thanks to Game Pass, I saved 34 pence, but I'd hardly call it a Tesco meal deal. It's a simple quest that goes as follows. We meet up with a guy in a factory he's purchased so he can begin exploiting working people. Like the upstanding citizen he is. However, this cesspit of sadness that he's purchased is actually haunted by a ghost that's quite partial to the occasional tannoy announcement. If you've ever taken psychedelics and gone to a big Asda, you probably know what he's on about. It's clearly not a ghost though, so we have to crawl into a basement to get to the bottom of this mystery. Sadly, all we find are some men's pyjama long johns in a treasure chest and a lengthy corridor leading into the abyss, all the while the ghostly voice is spouting communism. Without toil, we will cease to exist. The survival of our species depends on you. This community is the entire world. Your every act is focused on preserving and improving. I'm no genius, but I'm starting to suspect there's more afoot here. A feeling rapidly vindicated when we're attacked by a pile of skeletal hobs. Sadly, this is still Fable 3, we still can't die. So the skeletal hobs and their skeletal dogs pose no threat whatsoever. Turn back or die. You are not welcome here. Whoever this guy is, he doesn't understand how the game is designed, but anyway, nothing really interesting happens in this tunnel, you just fight some skeletal hobs. It's just a dull tunnel. This trap would have been a nice touch were there even the slightest chance I would have accidentally fallen into it. But we've explored Fable 3's aversion to challenge in the previous video to the point where it's old news now. So we're going to embrace our immortality and move on. Clearly the answers to whatever's going on lie at the end of this comically large cavern system beneath Albion's capital city that somehow nobody has ever noticed. Welcome back to Understood. As it turns out, there's an entire bloody town down here. I only just got here, how are we already friends? Fortunately, there's a lovely man named Albus on a bench who's willing to explain what's going on to us. Basically, this community has existed underground completely isolated from the outside world for decades, as a man named Montague is telling them that the outside world has been utterly decimated. So, Understone has no contact with the rest of Albion and that's the way it's been for decades and yet my actions on the surface have impacted how these people perceive me before I even fucking arrived. Besides that, there's no indication as to how this reclusive town even came to occur. 
but if anybody's going to know, it's going to be the guy barking orders from the mansion on the cliff. First contact with the outside world this town has had in years, and I'm already digging holes in it. So I hop in a lift that'll take me up to Montague's yard, and it's here where I'm met with more resistance. More cannon fodder enemies that pose no risk whatsoever, and a robot named Colin. Deploy the Colin. I really love when machines get underwhelming human names. It reminds me of the time I purchased a rusty rotten 1997 Skoda and named it Keith. It's an unspoken rule and universal means for letting the world know that something is utterly clapped. As for Colin here, it's quite cool that he can teleport on occasion, but we still can't die, so whilst he's completely unthreatening, it's nice that there's a bit of an addition to the enemy archetype variety. Refreshing, if only briefly, because poor Colin here is already dead. But at least now we can venture forth to Montague's manor unimpeded. As it turns out, Montague has been dead for some time, and all we've been hearing are simply pre-recorded messages, which is very lovely. In proving our worth by coming here, he believes we are the ones who can take charge of Understone citizens, meaning we can use this fancy looking machine to send a message to let the citizens know that the surface world is now safe and can be reopened and re-explored. And that would be a nice choice, however where would that be without a completely evil one to balance it out? As it turns out, Mr. Boyle, the factory owner, was 100% aware that his factory wasn't haunted and followed us through these caverns to Understone, and he has a counter proposition for us. Keep the people of Understone completely in the dark about the surface world and enslave them, having them make products for our profit. Now I could never exploit a populace like that, aside from every single instance of me exploiting the populace in this game alone. But I decided to free the town, simply put, because I can buy every property here anyway. So the city of Bowerstone gains a new district, and now I can purchase everybody's houses and rent them out at extortionate prices. So in reality, the people of Understone aren't free, they only think they are. But that choice does mark the end of this DLC's incredibly short quest. Returning at a later date, they somehow managed to get sunlight into this cave. And there are also businesses down here now, so I bought those two and ramped the prices up. Considering the main quest is behind us, there's no reason to even do this anymore. This is pure, unadulterated greed. Now this expansion's quest line is quite short, and it ends before it even feels like it started. And even though it is Fable 3, I did anticipate it having a little bit more meat to it, and it just didn't. So if you like an underground cave town, I guess it's alright, but it only ever feels like a full English breakfast when compared to the die pack. But this delightful little hamlet is not all the content this DLC has to offer. It also adds a shooting range to the mercenary camp near Mist Peak Valley, so that can be rather fun, unless you have potato aim like me. It's an entertaining minigame though, so what else do you need in life? And through doing it, you can also acquire some nifty rewards. The expansion also allows you to revisit Reaver's Mansion and participate in the Wheel of Misfortune as many times as you wish. So if the once wasn't enough for you, I suppose there's some enjoyment to be had in that. And as a cool detail, Understone shows up in Bowerstone Industrial looking like this. Being my first time playing this DLC, nostalgia has no bearing, so yeah, it is pretty wank. As was this other expansion that had me fight through boatloads of Balverines just to arrive at the Hunter's Lodge. A player home that's effectively a bright wall house copy and pasted into the snowy peaks of Mist Peak. You can't even rent this place out, it truly has nothing to add. And this one also cost me a bit of change and I honestly expected more out of that. But I get the feeling that I'll live. So I suppose all that leaves is Traitor's Keep. And I will say, I quite like this one. Unlike the Understone expansion, this one actually has some substance to it and functions as something of an epilogue to the Fable 3 main narrative. You see, it begins as another day as king at court, with Hobson rambling on about nonsense that you just don't care about, but suddenly there's a guy killing guards and he attacks us. As we fight, he rambles about his destiny to kill us and get revenge for everything that we've supposedly done. It's rather unclear what he's talking about, it just sounds like the ramblings of a madman. But that's by design, because we don't know about what this DLC is going to focus on. With the assassin dead, we discover that there is actually a secret prison where Logan had sent a lot of people. And this place, Ravenscar Keep, is likely where we will discover the answers needed to get to the bottom of why this assassin even wanted us dead to begin with. So we venture forth 
to prison, a completely new area off the coast of Albion, one where textures simply do not behave. You better pay your respects to the mighty green step. Turns out the attack was orchestrated by a fella named General Turner. Basically, he wants to abolish the monarchy. But he used the attempt on the king's life to draw some of the guards away so he could plot a prison riot, which is very courteous of him because now we have some more content to do. The bridge is on fire, but fortunately we can enter the prison through the comically large sewer. I wouldn't be surprised if General Turner was behind this. Nothing gets past this guy. So with our new friend Commander Milton, we explore the prison, in all of its horror, and fight our way through the rioting inmates. At least this place isn't going to have an overcrowding problem any time in the near future. As it turns out, General Turner and some rather high-profile, dangerous inmates that we've never heard of have escaped. So naturally, we're going to have to track them down. Fortunately, we know exactly where the first inmate's going to be, and that is, of course, Professor Faraday. But first of all, I checked out some of the side content on Raven's Car Keep. Checklist objective, killing random groups of escaped inmates. I am the king and yet I'm doing the guards grunt work for them. And then there's killing groups of hollow men, just in case you wanted to spice up the gameplay a bit and kill things that are already dead. There's a demon door that's planning a prison breakout. And then of course there's collecting Captain Turner's journals across the island. It isn't the most interesting mixture of side content, even for Fable 3 standards. But on the bright side, this is probably the longest I've gone in this game without being insulted by a gnome. So our first stop in the manhunt is Professor Faraday's Island. It has so many houses, 18 to be exact. I cannot wait to purchase them all and then rent them out for silly prices to people who cannot afford it. That's the dream. What I like about this expansion is it actually introduces several new areas. They're all islands, mind, and one of them is the prison itself, but it's nice to have some more locations in Fable 3. Now it only feels like half the game is missing. We meet up with a robot named Huxley. He's friendly, and he shows us the town and it's full of other robots just like him, and robot dogs. They have more or less the same design from the Colin from the Understone Keep expansion, and as it turns out, that's intentional. And now, presenting the latest in armed defense mechanisms, a round of applause for the Colin Mark II. The Colin Mark IIs are markedly shitter than the original Colin. After all, they can't teleport and they're easier to obliterate. If I wasn't sick of Colin already, I certainly was by the end of this mission. As we need to fight through an entire island of robots to reach Professor Faraday. Ah, oh, so clever and so happy. We could do this forever and ever. Exploding robot dogs is a neat touch. I'm quite partial to that. It makes a neat touch to combat because no doubt you don't wish to get blown up but you still can't die, so it really doesn't matter. But at least it's fun to fight through an area that you've never been to before, and will probably never have a reason to come back to ever again. But eventually we find Faraday, who actually finds us first and immediately clatters Milton, who quite literally does nothing to stop it. So he's going to spend the duration of the fight asleep on the floor, leaving us to deal with Faraday and his wearable Colin. But as we discover before we arrive at this fight, it's happening due to a complete breakdown of communications. You see, King Logan asked Faraday to build him an army. However, Faraday refused, so Logan imprisoned him. Considering he hasn't actually done anything wrong, and from his perspective, we're the aggressors, we're effectively persecuting this man just to kill time. So after what felt like an eternity of swinging a stick at Master Chief, we finally brought Professor Faraday to his knees. We get the option to spare his life, and if we do, we take him back to prison, promising to release him once he's recovered. Oh, and Commander Milton has miraculously recovered from a traumatic brain injury. And now it's time to hunt down Mary Godwin, Witchcraft Mary, which Hobson takes as an opportunity to demonstrate just how irritating he is. She's on another island that just so happens to be abandoned. Of course, it has a creepy mansion. After all, Witchcraft Mary is a witch. And this portion of the expansion actually had some entertaining combat segments. Why? Because these hollow men can only be hit if they're in this light area. And if they're not, they can't be hit. So you have to wait for them to step into that light area. And then you've got a window of time in which you can actually do damage. Which means that unless you figure out how it works, you're going to be there all day. It's not necessarily difficult, after all, the game does spell it out to you, 
It doesn't magically fix the combat or anything, but it just makes dealing with these hollow men just that little bit more interesting than usual, so it's greatly appreciated. After what feels like centuries battling through the gardens, we eventually sneak our way into the mansion where we encounter some disco hobs. I give this quest a 10 out of 10 for creativity with limited resources, and to be fair it isn't even done yet. Die hob! There are also multicoloured hobs that when you hit them a number of times they multiply into smaller, weaker hobs. Again, it doesn't necessarily revolutionise a weak combat system, but what it does do is make it at least entertaining for the moment. And then there are poison balverines. They're balverines, but slightly green in hue, I guess. And maybe a little bit bigger. And they have clouds of poison around them. They're just a bit tougher than regular balverines, really. I don't know what else to say. And then with that done, all that remains is to face... Witchcraft Dave, or whatever her name was, she uses the science she's been using to pit these unique enemies against us to turn herself into literally all of them at once. So we have to fight through waves of Witchcraft Dave, first as Rainbow Hobbs, and then as a horde of anti-sunlight hollow men, and then once that's dealt with, she transforms into a poison Balverine. I got knocked out more times than I care to admit. But eventually Witchcraft Dave lay defeated, and she safely returned to prison where she goes to bed. All that remains now is to catch General Turner. By the time we arrive in Hobson's room, we find Milton unconscious again, and Hobson is nowhere to be seen. I'm happier about that than perhaps I should be. Milton claims General Turner was in the prison all along, and has taken Hobson as a hostage. The laws of limited video game scripting notwithstanding, I'd say he has no leverage. But since we don't get a say, we have to fight through more prisoners, which leaves Milton injured, again. So now we have to go on alone. It doesn't take us long to find Hobson, who tells us that Milton has been behind it all along. But sadly, it's too late to do anything about it, because we're already fucked. When we come to, we no longer have a physical body, and our ex-new friend Milton tells us about his evil plans. As it turns out, General Turner's been dead for months, and he just happened to be his top disciple. Using Witchcraft Dave's magical machine, he's going to turn himself into us, and with his new hero powers, his immediate reaction is to attack the dog. I think I only know of one person who will be pleased. With that in mind, the new strategy is to break free, slap Milton up for the 60th time, and then watch him bleed out and die on the floor. And that is the ending of the Traitor's Keep main narrative. My only criticism is that Hobson is still alive, but this expansion functions as a decent little epilogue to the main story of Fable 3. And though it doesn't necessarily fix any of Fable 3's issues, and isn't anywhere near long enough to make the game feel actually long enough, Unlike the Understone expansion pack, it actually justifies its existence. But we aren't quite done yet. First, we need to return to Clockwork Island and help Huxley with a little project, collecting these parts all around the island and then giving them to him, so that he can make himself a friend. My companion is now fully assembled, and there was nothing left over from the construction save four screws and a worm gear. Ha ha. I made use of my jocularity mode there, of course. All that remains is to activate the new unit. Hello, I am Huxley. You are not Huxley, I am Huxley. The reward for doing this quest is important because now people will move here, which means we can buy the 18 properties that aren't cheap, but at this point in the game it really doesn't matter, and then rake in an awful lot of money renting them out, and charging people ludicrously inflated prices for the privilege of existing. As it turns out, I'm an incredibly underhanded evil bastard. But when you're this loaded, frankly, you transcend morality. So those are the actual Fable 3 expansions that I never played. Understone is rather bad unless you have wet dreams about real estate. This house can burn. Being able to transform my dog into a pink poodle with a potion is rather funny, but I honestly don't know why back in 2010 or 2011 people thought it was a great idea to hide cosmetics behind a paywall. Looking at the dye pack in particular, which apparently kicked up quite a controversy back when it dropped, but Traitor's Keep, though definitely not impressive, was quite enjoyable. But I'm gonna have to give the DLC a 3 out of 10 because you can't make pies and there are no gnomes. Such transgressions are utterly unforgivable, and I don't make the rules. Mmm, pie making perfection. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm going to bed.